Hello, everybody. It's me, Jonathan. I'm doing the Devo this morning. How crazy is that? Barrett is no more. Okay, I'm just kidding. Barrett actually asked me to do the Devo this morning. Barrett, if you're watching, I'm really sorry. You're the greatest, and uh, I, just, I just can't wait for you to do the Devo next week. I can hardly, I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. Um, here I am in my kitchen, by the way, everybody. Uh, uh, those are some pots and pans. I've made uh, eggs uh, in the pans, not the pots. Uh, the pots I've made pasta and noodles, uh, and there's some napkins over there, there's a stove, the toaster, all your basic great kitchen stuff. I, I've had many breakfasts, lunch, and dinners in this very room. It's a very important part of my childhood, and I'm just hungry for the word, so I'm in the kitchen. You like that? You like that little joke I just made? It's a good joke, right? Anyways, guys, in all, in all seriousness, I'm very excited to be sharing the diva with you this morning. Uh, we're actually going to be in a part of the Bible that is one of my personal favorite passages. In fact, it's a passage that has a lot of deep personal significance to me. And I really hope that by sharing it with you guys this morning, uh, it might have some deep personal significance to you guys as well uh, at the end of it. So today's passage, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. If you guys could flip to Luke chapter 9, we're going to be in verse 18. Let me just set the stage for you. It's actually a pretty simple passage, all things considered. Jesus is just praying, and his disciples are with him. Well, after Christ is done praying, he looks back at his disciples, and he asks them a simple question, which leads to one of the most important discussions and one of the most important uh, statements that have ever been made. So that's where we're going to be this morning in Luke chapter 9, verse 18. You can pause the video if you need to get there. I'm going to start reading. Luke chapter 9. Verse 18, here's what it says. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Okay, let's pause there. So Jesus is praying, and when he's done praying, he turns to his disciples. And he asks the disciples this question. He says, who do the crowds say I am? Who do the people say I am? The disciples answer, well, uh, some people think you're John the Baptist. Uh, other people think you're Elijah. And some people think that you are uh, a prophet from uh, a couple hundred years ago who's come back to life. Okay, then Jesus answers with another question. And he takes it and he makes it a much more, it's a much more personal question. He says to his disciples, okay then, well, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Well, good old loudmouth Peter is the first one to speak up. And Peter says, well, you're God. You're the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself in human form, fully God, fully man. And Jesus says to Peter, you're right. But he tells his disciples, he says, you guys got to be hush-hush about these things. Now, he said this because everything that was about to unfold for the disciples and for Jesus had to unfold the way it, it was supposed to. Jesus had to be betrayed by Judas. He had to be sent to the cross. He had to die on the cross. He had to come back from the dead because in order to do those things, he would give us salvation, eternal life with him, freedom from our sins. Well, then in verse 23, Jesus explains how this eternal life, how this resurrection of our souls can actually be achieved. He says it in verse 23. I'm going to read verse 23 again. He says three things that are three things that are, that are key in understanding how to have eternal life with Jesus. Now, here's what Jesus says. Verse 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow. These three things have a lot of importance behind them. And so this morning, we're going to camp out here in verse 23 of Luke 9, and we're going to look at these three different things. We're going to look at what it means to deny the self. We're going to look at what it means to take up your cross. We're going to look at what it means to follow Jesus. So we're just going to jump right into it as we tackle these three things here from verse 23. We're going to start with denying the self. You guys ever heard the term self-denial? That's basically when we convince ourselves that everything's okay, but it's really not. Have you guys seen this? This meme's like so done to death at this point, but it's like of the dog sitting in the burning room and he's just like, everything's fine, everything's fine, but the you know the fire is getting high and eventually the dog just like, it just like burns, you know? Like, have you ever seen that meme, that, that, that little comic? Like, that's self-denial right there. You know, that's that's self-denial. You know, we're, 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 it, something's obviously not true, but we're convincing ourselves that it's all okay. And it's all good. It's like, oh, you know what? I got all F's on my report card. My parents totally won't be mad at me. <laughs> That's self-denial. That is different from denying the self. These are two very different things. So let me explain to you guys what it means to deny the self. Simply put, to deny the self is to stop, is to stop striving or living for what our flesh wants. When Jesus talks about the self, he's talking about our flesh. And to deny the self is to deny our flesh, which means it's to, to, it's to deny worldly things, to deny going after the things we went after before Jesus, right? After we get saved, after we follow Jesus, we should no longer be living for the things that kept us from him. We shouldn't live for the things that we used to live for before. There should be a change after we follow Jesus. And part of that change is denying the self. Denying the self is being humble. It's putting our pride aside, uh, and it's putting others before ourselves, the needs of others before ourselves. And of course, it's putting the mission of God, of Jesus, before anything else in our lives. It's realizing that, you know what, I'm not the driver anymore. We're getting out of the driver's seat. We're realizing that we actually don't know best, shocker, and we let Jesus take over. But let me tell you guys something. When we deny the self, it is one of the most beautiful and amazing and absolutely freeing experiences we could ever have. When we deny the self, we're freed from the anxieties that once kept us held back when we were trying to strive for the self. You know, sometimes we feel like, oh, I need to live a certain way. I need to act a certain way. I need to speak a certain way. I need to look a certain way. Well, denying the self means we don't care about those appearances anymore. When instead we can learn to put others in Christ before ourselves, those things stop mattering. And it's a really awesome freedom that we're all given when we just simply learn to deny the self and follow after Jesus. So that's what denying the self is. Denying the self is humbling ourselves to go after God. Well, let's go into point number two. Point number two is take up your cross. Now this one sounds a little strange. Take up your cross. Jonathan, what does take up your cross mean? Well, if we want to understand exactly what Jesus is saying when he says take up your cross, we first got to understand what did the cross represent to Jesus? And if you, if you ask me, the cross represents the unattractive part of Jesus' mission. You know, we talk about, oh, love and resurrection and amazing things, and we talk about the salvation that Christ won for us, and I mean, yeah, it's fantastic. It's awesome. It was about love and, and life and all this, but in order to get to that point, Christ had to first go to the cross. And the cross was this rugged, big old piece of wood that Christ had to carry on his back, far, far on his back, while he was being whipped, spat on, mocked. And eventually, the cross was put up, and he was nailed to that cross. And he was humiliated on that cross. And he died on that cross. The cross was needed because the cross represents the burden of the sins that were laid on Jesus. The cross represents the pain and suffering that Christ had to endure in order to be the sacrifice that would give us the eternity. Now, a few hours of pain compared to an eternity of peace, you know, I'll tell you which one I prefer. 
But what the cross represents is the fact that just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean life's going to be a cakewalk. In fact, when we follow Jesus, we're almost more likely to attract some bad attention. Because this is a world that doesn't always follow Christ. And as a result of that, people will come against us, persecute us, look down on us. You know, just because we accept Christ does not mean life goes on easy mode. Now look, it's pretty nice because before we were living for Jesus, when we had all of our problems, it was just us who had to handle it, right? And that's a whole lot to deal with. But after we come to Christ, our problems don't go away, but instead of having to handle our problems all on our own, we have the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-amazing God of all creation on our side, and you better believe he knows how to help us in the right ways. But taking up your cross is recognizing that, you know what, just because I follow Christ, life's not going to be easy. Life's going to be tough. But that's okay. Because we're suffering for Christ. Because we're living for Christ. By the way, I'm not sure if you can hear that. There are kids screaming outside. I'm sorry if that's distracting. But uh, they're... It sounds like they're having fun. Anyway, it's living for God, but realizing that's not always easy. It's also this. The cross also represents not stooping down to the level of those who persecute us. Christ could have called down fire and hail from heaven to take care of all the people who were putting him on the cross, but he didn't. In fact, he died for them so that they may one day experience the same love and joy we do. So when people come against you, when people persecute you for believing in Jesus, pray for them. Don't harbor hatred against them. Pray that they may one day experience the life-changing love that you yourself have experienced. Because that love really changes the game. So that's what, that's what uh, taking up your cross is. It's realizing that the Christian life is not always an easy one, but it's one that's worth it, and it's one filled with love for all people, even those who are persecuting us. All right, third point, last one, and the most simple one. It's follow. Follow means to follow. It's just living for God, right? It's following after him. To follow Christ means that we devote our lives to Jesus, that we give our lives over to Jesus, that the things we do, the actions we take, the life we live, it's for him. Following Christ is devoting ourselves to a relationship with him. It's to living our lives, it's to live our lives according to the word uh, of his Bible, you know, his holy word here. We focus on him, we listen to him, we follow him by living for him and by living for nobody else. We live for Christ and Christ alone. You know, you, you can't follow two people if they're going in two different directions. When it comes to following Jesus, we follow him before we follow anybody else, anything else, before we follow after ourselves. Living for Jesus is freedom from those things. Living for Jesus, because because I don't know about you guys, in life there just seems to be, you know, before I got saved, there were just so many different pathways you could go on, so many different things you could live for, and it just it was overwhelming. But what God tells us, what Christ tells us, is that life doesn't have to be this overly complicated, stressful thing. He says, yeah, life is hectic, life can be crazy, but there aren't, you don't have to go down a million different pathways to have peace. Instead, Jesus says, fix yourselves on the highest possible good, that's God, and just follow me. Follow after Jesus. And when we follow after Jesus in the words of God, everything else falls into play. Everything else falls into play. And we have this awesome peace. And it all comes from devoting our lives to following Christ. So those are the big three things we talked about, denying the self, humbling ourselves to live for God, taking up our cross, knowing that this life is tough, but it's a life still filled with love, and then following Christ by devoting our lives to him. Now look, I understand that it can be intimidating and difficult to follow after God, especially a God that we can't see, a God that a lot of people doubt even exists. I can assure you that he does exist. 
and that it is worth it to follow him. But following Jesus is a big decision, and it's a decision that we make on our own. You know, it's not a decision that anyone forces on us. It's an authentic, natural decision we make when we realize that we have a need for Jesus. We realize we have a need for Jesus when we recognize the fact that there's sin in our lives, that on our own, we could never do it, that on our own, our actions and our decisions have kept us separated from God. So we realize that Jesus Christ, yeah, he actually was the Son of God. He was God himself, and that through his, that, that he did actually die and rise again from the cross, and by doing that, he opened the door to eternal life. And it's only through that sacrifice, and that sacrifice alone, that we can have it. That's when we take that step through that open door. When we realize those things and embrace those things, we follow into a relationship with Jesus that is the most beautiful and peaceful thing you can think of that takes us all up into eternity. Now I want to ask you, have you been living your life through these struggles, going back and forth on these things? Has life been overwhelming to you and stressful? Have you felt a tugging on your heart that something's wrong? Well, if you have, and if you think you're ready to make a big step, I would love to lead you in a prayer and to help you begin to follow Jesus. If you would like to know Jesus, to follow him and be in relationship with him, just bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray this prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I recognize that I've made mistakes. I understand that my sins have kept me from you and that on my own, I can never make it in this life. Jesus, I recognize that you are God, that you are the Son of God, that you died and rose again from the cross. And by doing so, Lord, you died for my sins. And by your power, I can be freed from that weight. Jesus, I want to follow you. Please forgive me of my sins, Lord, and come into my life. Help me begin this amazing relationship with you, Lord. Help me focus on the highest possible good and follow you, Jesus. Come into my life, Lord. And thank you for your great love. And please teach me how to love like you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Look, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to be the first to congratulate you and welcome you into the kingdom of God. You're saved. This is fantastic. Your eternal life is good as golden. And you're beginning this wonderful journey of following after Jesus. To those of you who have already made the decision, who have been following Christ, let me remind you that following after Jesus, it's not a one and done deal. Following God is a progression. It's a process in life. We keep at it every day. We pray the prayer, we get saved, but if we want our peace to increase, if we want to get closer to God, we have to keep following him. So I encourage you guys, be in the word, pray, support your brothers and sisters who have just made the decision to follow God. Know that Jesus is with you, he's paving the way for us, and that he loves you dearly. Now we get to live this life for the right reasons. And when we follow God, he's there with us, guiding our steps, protecting us, and loving on us. So for those of you who made that decision today, so excited for you. Wonderful things ahead. Not always easy things, but wonderful things are ahead as you follow Jesus. Thanks so much, guys. I love all of you. Hope to see you out on Wednesday nights. Remember to follow after Jesus and just to live in his love and his grace and to show that to each other. Love you guys. See you soon.